Commission will come to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all of you attending in person or virtually to this afternoon's September 2023 Federal Maritime Commission meeting. Today, the Commission continues its practice of providing regular updates uh, for uh, on the implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. Since the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, the Commission has worked diligently to implement the goals of this landmark legislation aimed at easing the supply chain crisis. The Commission, in no small measure through the hard work of its staff, has made considerable headway in accomplishing OSRA's directives. The positive impacts of the Commission's work are already being felt throughout the shipping industry, and I think the activity that we're seeing uh, in uh, various departments of the FMC is testimony to that. Today, we'll hear from staff about the Commission's ongoing efforts to implement key components of OSRA 2022's requirements. Staff will also provide an update on the work being accomplished by the Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services, an office that we, had, uh, that we have had but now is mandated by OSRA. With that, we will turn to the updates on this afternoon's agenda. Madam Secretary, the Commission is ready for the first item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item on the agenda is a staff briefing on the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, presented by Managing Director Lucille Marvin and General Counsel Chris Huey. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Maffei, Commissioners Dai, Bensel, Sola, and Beckich. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, or OSRA, in this public session. General Counsel Chris Huey and I will update the public about the status of implementation of OSRA at the FMC. I'd like to remind our public viewers today that a lot of what I'm about to say is on our website, uh, www.fmc.gov. We have a special OSRA implementation page, um, and we encourage everyone to refer to it for all things OSRA related. So starting with the enforcement topic, I'll now turn the mic over to our general counsel, Chris Huey. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Lucy. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. The Ocean Shipping Reform Act mandated that the agency complete three substantive rulemakings, one on demerge and detention, one to define what constitutes an unreasonable refusal to deal with respect to vessel space accommodations, and one to define unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods by common carriers. Uh, turning first to demerge and detention, Section 7 of OSRA empowers the Commission to adjust the information requirements of demerge and detention invoicing through the rulemaking process. The FMC's Fact Finding 29 initiated this project through an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking published in February 2022 before OSRA became law. Following the passage of OSRA, the Commission issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in October. The draft proposed to adopt minimum information that common carriers must include in a demerge or detention invoice, add to this list additional information that must be included in or with such an invoice, further define prohibited practices by clarifying which parties may be appropriately billed, and establish practices that billing parties must follow when invoicing for demerge or detention charges. The comment period for this proposed rule closed in December 2022. The Commission received about 200 comments on the draft. I can now state uh, from the perspective of the Office of General Counsel that the process of drafting a final rule for the Commission's consideration and vote is nearly complete. We are also reviewing several late filed substantive comments that have come in within the past month. Um, so that constitutes the current status of that um, rulemaking project. The second one is uh, refusal to deal. Section 7D of OSRA directed the commission to complete a rulemaking to define the language, quote, unreasonable refusal to deal or negotiate with respect to vessel space, end quote. The agency started this rulemaking process immediately upon the passage of OSRA, and a proposed rule was published in September 2022. After reviewing the comments submitted in response to the proposed rule, the Commission published a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking in June of this year. In the SNPRM, the Commission proposed to, among other things, define unreasonable by stating a general principle and a non-exhaustive list of examples of unreasonable conduct establish the elements for a refusal of cargo space accommodations, 
refi revise the definition of transportation factors to focus on vessel operation considerations, clarify that vessel space services were already included in the definition of vessel space accommodations and add a definition for cargo space accommodations, require a documented export policy, and remove the voluntary certification provision that had been in the previous draft. The comment period for the SNPRM closed about seven weeks ago. Uh, the commission received approximately 30 comments uh, equally divided between shippers and carriers. Uh, now, we in Office of General Counsel are in the process of reviewing those comments and drafting a proposed final rule for your consideration and vote. The third substantive rulemaking is uh, with respect to uh, unfair, unjust. Uh, Section 7C of OSRA requires the commission to define the phrase unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods in the context of uh, the text at Section 41104A3 that prohibits uh, resorting to other unfair or unjustly discriminatory methods. Uh, the SNPRM on unreasonable refusal to deal actually took on part of this requirement by adding a section addressing alleged unreasonable refusals of cargo space accommodations. For the remaining parts of this requirement not addressed in the refusal to deal SNPRM, we and OGC are preparing a proposed rule for the Commission's consideration and vote. Uh, that constitutes uh, the update on the three substantive OSRA rulemakings. So I now turn back to uh, the Managing Director for an update on charge complaints. Thank you, Chris. Um, as, as Chris just said, I'll talk about Section 10 of OSRA charge complaints. And this enables shippers to submit to the FMC information about complaints of charges assessed by a common carrier. The Commission's been receiving and investigating charge complaints since the passage of OSRA, um, and specifically that's June 16th of 2022. So as a refresher under charge complaints, shippers submit to the FMC complaints of charges assessed by a common carrier that they believe to be unreasonable. Commission staff promptly investigates these complaints and orders refunds and or penalties that don't comply with the Shipping Act. Our charge complaints program continues under an interim procedure. So since the enactment of OSRA, the commission has received 402 charge complaints and more come in each week. 167 complaints have met the base threshold for investigation. Some investigations were not opened because they concerned matters that either predated OSRA 2022, and we're obviously seeing less of those. Um, some submissions were just incomplete and were never subsequently completed, or the matter submitted was not really suitable for a charge complaint investigation. 104 of those investigations were voluntarily resolved by the carrier, um, issuing a refund or a waiver. 43 investigations have been completed. 36 of those investigations determined that the evidence didn't support a claim that the charges were not in compliance with the charge complaint sections of the Shipping Act. And those shippers were subsequently notified that this of this determination and other potential avenues at the FMC where they could they could get some help. Um, 20 cases are currently under investigation. So where complaints are not resolved voluntarily during the investigatory stage and our investigation determines there is evidence to support a claim that the charge or charges were not compliant with the Shipping Act, the Office of Enforcement will pursue a charge complaint on behalf of the complainant by recommending that an order to show cause be issued by, um, uh, by the commission to the carrier. Through this order to show cause proceeding, the commission will determine whether the charge is appropriate. If it's not, the commission will order a refund or waive the charge. The commission will also determine whether to refer the matter to the administrative law judge for a civil penalty proceeding. So to date, seven cases were referred to the Office of Enforcement to move forward with the order to show cause process. For six referred cases, the carriers refunded the charges before the order, order to show cause was issued. One order to show cause was issued and the proceeding is ongoing. The charge complaint process continues to drive informal settlements and waivers of mainly detention and demurrage cases. To date, voluntary waivers and refunds for charge complaints total $1.7 million. Commission staff will use experience gained from the current interim procedure to guide the commission on what form a permanent process should take. And we're in the middle of, of looking at that right now. 
Uh, a permanent procedure will be completed through a formal rulemaking after notice and public comment. And as I said, the commission's work on this rulemaking will begin later this year, but we're already looking at, at, at a more permanent procedure. So uh, let me just take this opportunity to remind the public again on how to engage the, the charge complaint process. So parties interested in disputing charges assessed by common carriers uh, that they believe may not comply with OSRA can submit a charge complaint by doing the following. Identify the common carrier, identify the specific alleged OSRA violations under 46 USC 41102 or 41104A. Gather supporting documentation, including invoices, bills of lading numbers, and evidence of whether the charges have been paid. Confirm that the disputed charge was incurred on or after the enactment of OSRA 22, which was June 16th, 2022, as I said earlier. And finally, submit all of this and any other materials you think are relevant to charge complaints at fmc.gov. And charge complaints is all one word. You'll receive an acknowledgement from our charge complaints team within two days of submission. If the commission receives sufficient information, we'll promptly start an investigation, which could ultimately result in an order against the carrier, as I explained, or a refund of charges paid and an assessment of a civil penalty by the commission, as I've said. Reviews of charge complaints can take up to 30 days, depending on the thoroughness of the submission and the matter to be investigated. Our charge complaints team will help parties submitting complaints to understand the nature of any rejected uh, submissions. And of course, we will help parties along the way with their submissions. We'll also assist parties to find other appropriate avenues at the commission to file complaints if the charge complaints process isn't suited to a particular matter, as I said, whether that would be through a formal process or informally through our Office of Consumer Assistant and Dispute Resolution Services, which you're gonna hear more about, the commission likely has other options for assistance um, that, that um, include commercial billing disputes. So after this meeting, any members of the public that have further, have further questions, not only are we standing by to, to help um, and, and, and talk with you, um, just send through our, our, the email address that I gave earlier, but also the commission published a webinar on charge complaints on the FMC website. So you can also refer to that, but please don't hesitate. I say this to the public, please don't hesitate to contact us at charge complaints at fmc.gov. We will of course keep the public apprised of all developments on charge complaints through our website. Um, I encourage everybody to refer to it, as I said before, and uh, of course, we're standing by to assist anyone. So that is charge complaints. Um, I'll now turn to implementation updates on provisions of OSRA that have a public informational or consumer assistance focus. Section 17A specifically requires the FMC to establish a web page that allows for the submission of comments, complaints, concerns, reports of non-compliance, requests for investigation, and requests for alternative dispute resolution. Commission staff is working on this webpage as we speak. It satisfies this requirement and will be online later this fall. Section 18 of OSRA provides the FMC with temporary emergency authority to issue an emergency order requiring any common carrier or marine terminal operator to share certain information with shippers and other spe specified entities in emergency situations impacting the competitiveness and reliability of the ocean, uh, the international transportation supply system. The commission issued to the public a request for information on current market conditions looking at this. And after a careful review of those of the market conditions ourselves and of the submitted comments, we found that circumstances did not warrant invoking a temporary emergency authority and this authority continues until December 16th of this year. So section 19 of OSRA directs the FMC to enter into an agreement with the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine under which the TRB will carry out a study and develop best practices for on-terminal or near-terminal chassis pools that provide service to marine terminal operators motor carriers, railroads, and other stakeholders that use chassis pools with the goal of optimizing supply chain efficiency and effectiveness. We expect that the study will be completed 
and that the FMC will post the best practices on or before April of 2024. That's the deadline. To meet this goal, the FMC and the TRB executed a contract in September of, of 2022, so that was last year, and the TRB formed a committee that has held six public meetings, the most recent of which was held this week on Monday and Tuesday in Joliet, Illinois. All work is proceeding on schedule. Finally, OSRA contains certain reporting and publishing requirements for the commission that we're prepared to execute or have already executed. For our most recent annual report, um, which is available on our website, included a report to Congress concerning practices by state-owned, state-controlled, and certain foreign-owned ocean common carriers. That's section 14 of OSRA. The annual report also provides false detention and demerge invoice information in all penalties imposed or assessed against common carriers. Um, this information is, is actually also available on our website, and that is Section 6 of OSRA. The FMC is also responsible for publishing qu a quarterly report describing the total import and export tonnage and the total loaded and empty TEUs per vessel making port in the U.S. and its territories. This is Section 9. Planning and preparation for this information collection is well underway at the Commission. We have already sought public comments on this information collection. We did that at the end of last year. And the collection is before OMB for the final approval. We'll provide an update once this information collection is approved. So this concludes our presentation on commission implementation of OSRA. We look forward to keeping the public appraised of, of our implementation process, and we'll continue to issue industry advisories or guidance when necessary. Thank you for your time today. Well, thank you, Ms. Marvin and Mr. Huey for this update. I wanna say that uh, the commission commends and appreciates the steadfast commitment of, shown by both of you and your staffs. Uh, and I would also like to recognize all of the FMC staff, um, even those uh, who are not involved uh, directly in OSRA implementation have had to uh, do more in order to keep all of our other programs going and, and strong because uh, we need we need to do all of that stuff. So very much, much appreciate, uh, as I as I say many, many times, not publicly, but but you know, want to say publicly, uh, the staff at the commission and how hard they've worked in this uh, heavy period for us, given given the implementation of this uh, new law. Um, I'm going to I'm going to see if any of my uh, commissioners have any questions at this point before going on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Dye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thank you for the briefing. I want to clarify, um, uh, there are there are actually two demerge and detention sections in OSRA. And I've observed that there's some confusion because um, we have concentrated so far on the billing side of detention and demurrage. There is also a freestanding section uh, to require um, a clarification of the interpreted rule. Um, and um, to the extent there, there is any, there are any questions or confusion about that, I'm sure our staff would be delighted to discuss that with you. And uh, Lucy, on uh, charge complaints, do most of these charge complaints go first to the ocean carrier for consideration? Um, Commissioner Dye, thank you for that question. I, I do think that it probably depends on, on, it's probably fact specific as to sort of what the steps are in each charge complaint, um, not trying to be kind of, you know, fuzzy on that, but I do think it 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 depends on on um, on the situation. But you know, I do know that um, things for the most part do go to the ocean carrier. And um, you know, our hope is, of course, always that before people come to us, they have tried to work out their issue with their carrier. Um, and that, you know, they're coming to us because they weren't able to do that. Yes. Um, that goes faster usually. Yes. But, and, and obviously this, this whole process is meant to be quick. 
Um, it's meant to be efficient and that's why it was created in the first place. But once we do get something, we usually get the carrier involved as soon as, you know, all of the information is together. So, but it's, but it's our experience that it is better to first make an attempt yes. with the ocean carrier um, to work out a Absolutely. complaint and then come to us yes. if you continue to be satisfied with the carrier's response. I absolutely agree. And I would say that goes for any issue um, that, uh, you know, any of our stakeholders are having. If you can try to work things out together, if that doesn't work, we have many avenues at the FMC to help come yes. to mutually agreeable solutions. Again, our goal is always to keep things moving. Yes. And all carriers are required to have mm. processes for dispute resolution currently. Um, so, um, so that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And when you, and when you, when you discuss, um, that we would probably move to a, to formal or an informal process, when you mean formal, you mean probably a notice and comment rulemaking. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Yes. We will have public participation in anything that we do. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Commissioner Benzel. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the briefing, uh, Managing Director. Um, I did want to follow up on, on the question that uh, that uh, Commissioner Dye brought up, and that's the charge complaint process. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that the process is basically there's the complaint, and then there's a response that's filed uh, by the ocean carrier or the NDOCC, whichever the case may be. Uh, what steps do we take into uh, after that response is filed? Um, uh, I, you know, the, the fact that we require a response to be filed seems to lead to the need to maybe address the response to discuss that response before we go immediately into an order to show cause. What is, what is the process um, that's afforded uh, ocean carriers or NDOCCs now currently? And you said, I think that it's a case by case basis, but the question would be, should we have a requirement that, that, that we respond to that response. Uh, it seems like the fact that they've set up a response would mean that it's used for some purpose. Uh, and so is there any interaction after the response is filed before we take steps to go to the immediate uh, 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 action of sh uh, uh, showing cause? Thank you, Commissioner Benzel, for that question. Um, I'm glad you asked because I think it's uh, it, it allows us just to talk about our process and keep things transparent. But yes, um, I, I think the whole purpose of, of this charge complaints process, obviously we were talking, it's supposed to be quick, it's supposed to be efficient, but that is not at the expense of everyone who's involved getting their say. I think that's very a very important point. Uh, and I'm glad that you've pointed that out, but we absolutely, our investigators, look at these issues very carefully and um, look at responses from parties and, and address these matters. Um, I don't think anything in the charge complaints process is supposed to happen sort of unilaterally as a penalty. Um, uh, so I appreciate the question. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it does, okay. it gives, gives rise to, to concerns that we're, even though we're taking, uh, you know, an expedited uh, due process uh, consideration to order these refunds and, and intentionally statutorily provided. Uh, so I do think that we need to make sure that uh, those uh, responses are evaluated before we uh, unilaterally make a decision to take enforcement. So absolutely agreed. So, so that's uh, just something I, I bring to your attention. Um, uh, the the other question I had is there's a couple of provisions that uh, that we didn't talk about. Section three of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act gives us the authority to look at, uh, and I know we we have so much on our plate right now, so that that uh, these are further out. Uh, and section seventeen on uh, shipping exchange uh, registries, and I think there's a lot of issues there in terms of uh, enforcement of service contracts and. Uh, fall downs and, and issues like that. So I'm looking forward to getting to that. I know we have too much on our plate right now. So, but I would just bring that uh, to your attention as issues that we are required to consider as we go through uh, OSRA implementation. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel, Commissioner Sola. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks everybody for coming out today. Um, on the uh, implementation of the rulemaking, Mr. Huey, let me say that this is a, a very exciting time for us. I believe the Congress gave us a, a mandate and I'd like to thank them for not giving us a second mandate with Ocean Shipping Reform Act II uh, so quickly. Um, but it's almost like an academic um, electrical storm that's kind of going on in the office to get this language right. And I know that I've had conversations with you and your staff, um, also even at the water cooler, so to speak, and what is the best language to go forward to make sure that we get this right. And I appreciate all the hard work that has been done there. And, and I believe that the, the products that we're seeing are, reflect a lot of that work that we're doing. Um, uh, Ms. Marvin, on the, on the charge complaints, I, I think it's absolutely astonishing that we've uh, recovered over a million dollars so far. Um, and, you know, my question is, is that when somebody does submit a complaint, are we able to tell them if they meet the criteria quickly? Because I, I think what could happen is, you know, we could get a lot of uh, shippers and other people could cast a very wide net to, to go ahead and see if it works. So I think it'd be very good to be able to get them that information back quickly. Yes, sir. I, I agree, um, Commissioner Sola. It's uh, it's important that um, we get back to people quickly. And I think that our um, our investigatory staff tries to do that as, as quickly as possible. As things come in, I know things are reviewed uh, right away. And if, uh, if there's not enough information, the parties are alerted and um, they can choose to submit more information or let their charge complaint close. Uh, we do have that initial intake process, though, and um, I know our investigators try to get back to people within two days of submission. So, wow, that's that's very good. I'm I'm familiar with some of the other complaint processes in federal government, Consumer Financial Protection Board, Department of Transportation. They're usually about a 30 day window, I think, before they get back. So, you know, the idea that we're doing this at a, a, a fraction of the amount of time that they are is is, is very uh, compelling. Thank you. They are working very hard to make sure that this process is speedy. And, and well done so far. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Beckage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am uh, really uh, happy to be part of the uh, robust rulemaking for OSTRA 1. And um, I feel that we have uh, done a good job of soliciting and receiving input from the industry on all, all different factors and sides. Sorry, I'm a, this is not our home field. So, no one has ever accused Mr. Beckage of being too quiet, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My reputation, uh, I think, is exaggerated. So, uh, but uh, it's, a, again, pleasure to be part of this collaborative uh, commission. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure working on these with the uh, fellow commissioners and staff on, uh, on uh, working forward to uh, finishing rulemaking on OSTRA 1. And, um, you know, I'm not so sure OSTRA 1 will answer all the problems in the industry. Uh, since we have a once in a generation chance to address this issue, uh, you know, I'm, Hopefully, OSRA 1 answers most of the questions, but if we have to deal with OSRA 2, I think our staff and our agency and commission can handle it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Beckage. And I um, actually, I want to um, uh, echo the remark that I, I kind of interrupted, which was just that uh, it uh, part of the reason why uh, these rules are, are taking some time is because we got such uh, constructive comments from all sorts of different facets of uh, the industry and shippers and uh, various groups. And, and that is terrific. And, and uh, one of the reasons why we really are trying to make sure that we get this uh, final language um, as good as we can, um, uh, you know, and, and make sure that it reflects the, uh, um, the both the letter and the um, purpose of the law. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, one question I think I, I know the answer to, I actually think you already answered it, but it's just so important to emphasize this. Um, Ms. Marvin, if if a complaint does not, it's one of those ones that did not meet the criteria or it does not meet the criteria for, criteria for a charge complaint, 
can it still be um can there still be a claim filed under something else under 4111 i'm sorry 41104 or uh can we still investigate it in the office of uh, of enforcement Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad that, that you're emphasizing this point um, because one thing, we definitely don't want the public to walk away with the impression that if your charge complaint didn't quite meet the, the threshold that you're, you're out. Um, and that's certainly not the case. Um, as I said earlier, we, uh, we have many different um, avenues at the commission to help people with their commercial disputes, um, whether that be uh, informally, um, there could be something that really does rise to the level of litigation. Um, obviously, we want, we want to keep as much out of litigation as possible as that slows down everything for everyone involved. Uh, but nonetheless, we have all these different avenues. And, and I, uh, uh, Zariah is going to talk about that as well when she, we she talks about our caters program. Um, and uh, yeah, and we also do look at, at our charge complaint submissions carefully um, with an eye towards, you know, how, how do we uh, how do we take this matter and, and help this person further? So or these parties further. So, yes, there's it, it is not just a, a one and done. Um, things uh, can go to other. You know, we can deal with things in other avenues. Thank you for that question. Um, Another, uh, getting a bit more technical, the charge complaint process is an interim process. Um, do, what is involved in making that a permanent process uh, goes to either one of you. I don't know if it's a legal matter or a management matter or both. Um, I, I can take a swing at it unless our general counsel wants to. Um, uh, what we would have to do is um, make make the process official and and produce regulations for our, our, our public to follow. Um, I think what we wanted to do is obviously um, take a walk in these shoes for for about a year to make sure that we're doing things uh, most efficiently and effectively for the public and in, in the speediest way. Um, so uh, it would really be a, a, a publicly, um, you know, we would announce something publicly, we would want comments, we would want to make sure that that we hear from our stakeholders on how the process is going, what changes they think we should make, uh, along with, you know, a proposal of, of if, if we decide anything should change. Um, we do think things are going well, um, but again, we would put this to the public to make it official. Um, I'm going to yield to uh, Commissioner Benzel for a follow-up question. Just a, just a short one. This is an issue that's been percolating, but the charge complaint process has been interpreted to be more broad than just attention and demerge charges. It's uh, any charge that we uh, determined uh, to be unreasonable. That's right, sir. For the most part, we do receive a lot of detention and demerge um, matters, but that doesn't mean it's limited to that. Right. Yeah, I just my my point being that it was deliberately vague uh, uh, to give us the uh, ability to look at all sorts of allegations. And so so just want to make sure that there was nothing that would restrict uh, these the charge complaint process from being used on anything else. As you as you do that, you know, administer this interim process, are you, are you I'm not going to ask you, don't worry, I won't ask you for the specific recommendations, but are you sort of collecting um, observations and things that we could do to improve it when we do the permanent one? Yes, sir, we definitely are. And, and that's what we've really been spending, um, I would say, you know, the last year doing, um, just ensuring that, uh, you know, we keep what works, we get rid of what doesn't work, um, and uh, again, just make this as effective for the public as possible. Okay, is there a deadline uh, under which we have to have the permanent procedure? No, sir, there is not. Okay. Um, I'll just quickly see if there's any other questions from the commission on this part of the program. Okay. Well, I'm, I know uh, I'm sounding like a broken record, but I, I just really appreciate uh, the two of you, but also all of the staff. Um, I don't think we have too much on our plate, but we have we have a big meal uh, that we are going through. Uh, as I said to uh, uh, one of the um, Republican uh, co-sponsors uh, that's on our committee. Um, you know, we, we've got a big bowl of Cheerios we need to get through before we'll be able to uh, have another big bowl. So uh, really, really appreciate the hard work that goes into that. And with that, Madam Secretary, the commission is ready for the second item on the agenda.
Mr. Chairman, the second item on the agenda is a staff briefing on consumer affairs and dispute resolution services presented by Director Zoraya de la Cruz. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners Dai, Vensel, Sola, and Vekic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to give you an update about the activities for caters. While our program- Ms. Della Cruz, can you speak? Uh, the, the mics are grabbing a little bit. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> While our program has been around since 2005, the Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services, i.e. caters, continues to operate as an alternative dispute resolution office. Caters assists parties facing problems with international ocean shipments or their cruise travel. The assistance is intended to be quick, informal, voluntary, and available to all, including our regulated entities. Cater staff also serve as mediators for formal proceedings filed at the commission. In addition, our staff is available not only to respond to questions submitted via email or phone call, but also to provide outreach services. Overall, Cater's assistance is free, and we try to ensure that the cargo keeps moving. No one wins when there are delays, and our services can help parties avoid the cost, risk, and time required uh, to pursue litigation. When we assist in a mediation, even if there is no settlement, the attempt to solve a dispute through our services produces great benefits to our stakeholders. Parties are able to narrow down the issues. They uh, gain a better understanding about the application of the commission's regulations and statutory authority, or they gain more insight where to focus discovery. In the end, many find caters mediation services to be valuable and ultimately do settle at a later date before a decision is rendered. Thanks to your support, Cater staff has grown in a meaningful way over the past two years. Last year, we added three transportation industry analysts and two attorneys from the private sector with ocean shipping industry experience. With a total of nine, we have more than doubled the staff from two years ago. When we had four people, including just two attorneys handling all of the commercial and household goods cases for the whole country. Um, our TIAs respectively have over 20 years maritime experience and we are able to immediately, or they are able to immediately assist with commercial cargo cases that we receive. Cater's web pages have been updated with useful information for our stakeholders, and we will add new content as the industry we regulate evolves. We are looking forward to updated IT systems to track matters in our office as the FMC continues to modernize. I hope to create videos, infographics, and other media that is user-friendly and easily accessible to the public. This is vital to educating the public and progressing in our efforts to prevent com commercial harm as much as we do to help resolve real-time problems today. We have helped almost every type of entity in the supply chain, and if we cannot help, we try to find someone else who can, whether that is a different office within the commission or a different federal or state government office. In FY23, we handled 305 informal disputes and public assistance matters. Um, out of that, there were 197 commercial cargo disputes. 42 of them were from exporters and 155 were importers. I will be showing you a few, a few slides um, that show where we have received our calls from and give a special focus on our export cases. But first, um, I want to provide a few examples of cases where assistance has helped some parties recover money, but also gain release of their goods and avoid further escalation of their difficult situations. The first example involves an agricultural importer that was importing several containers from Europe to Hawaii. The root cause of the dispute was a failure to meet the minimum quantity requirements. Caters was able to facilitate a new agreement that allowed for the release of the containers that were on hold and for the ones on the water to avoid delays and charges upon arrival. The NVOCC, um, that was the consignee, avoided our 30, 000, uh, over 30,000 in demurrage and the value of the goods were estimated to be over a million dollars. 
Another case involved 18 import shipments of reefer containers, and they were unable to secure appointments to return the empty reefers. Uh, the BOCC had designated the terminal, and that terminal was not accepting empty, uh, empty returns. As a result, the VOCC then um, invoiced 116,400 for detention fees. When the importer contacted our office, um, it had stated they were not getting a response from the vessel operator. So we were able to contact, um, well, also they were threatening to close the motor carrier division for that NBO, uh, the account for them. Um, we helped them compile the evidence and then uh, reach out to the legal team. And after several meetings, uh, several weeks, they agreed to reduce the amount due by 82% and save the importer over $100,000. These are just a couple of examples where we try to help. Um, many times caters can make a difference. Um, I should also say that we do receive specific requests for rapid response, and we do review those immediately um, to see if those shipments, if they involve shipments that are due to arrive or that containers are being held. Otherwise, um, overall, our staff acts very quickly, often the same day, but overall, we will review matters quickly and provide acknowledgement within 24 to 48 hours of receipt from the complaints inbox. Overall, our workload for this past year, um, caters handled 305, I'm sorry, in FY22, we handled 334 cases, 167 that were commercial cargo and 131 that were PBO. This year, we've handled 305 cases total, 197 commercial cargo, 34 household goods, and 74 PBO. Yeah, can you just, I'm sorry to interrupt what PBO means. I'm sorry, passenger vessel um, cruise. Like cruise lines. Yes. Okay. yes, cruise ship, cruise um, travel. Um, I believe there has been a decrease in the PVO cases because the cruises have resumed and the majority of future cruise credits have been utilized and um, they either booked a new cruise or for a few, some have the future cruise credit expired. Um, we have a few slides um, and I'm going to go ahead and try to make sure this works. Uh, just to see the breakout in comparison for this year, 65% were commercial cargo, 24% were passenger, and 11% household goods. I do believe the 11% of household goods is because throughout the pandemic and post, people were not traveling, but it has very incrementally increased, and I would expect that may increase um, this coming year. Um, overall, what was kind of exciting uh, to find out was that the complainants um, contacting us, it's a good portion of the country. It is not just isolated to major cities, um, which is, you know, encouraging that we are reaching different parts. And I know the outreach that you commissioners have done uh, on our behalf, I think it is working. Um, this other slide talks about the commercial cargo cases broken out. Uh, it was 21% export, 79% import. I will speak a little bit more about our upcoming export efforts. And then this was a breakout of the commodity that was involved for export cases. And so it is interesting that agriculture uh, was the largest at 44%. Uh, vehicles is the next one in 27%, and then it's a slew of others following. But um, it, you, you know, we can say that it's not just one type of commodity. Uh, so again, that's um, a positive thing for our outreach. Um, as far as where the ports of loading were located for export cases, um, LA, Long Beach, definitely the largest. But then it's interesting to see that Miami, Norfolk, and you know, several other cities followed. So again, we are reaching people throughout the country um, on the export side. And then um, 
I'm going to go back here. I do want to highlight some of the work that uh, Caters has completed um, specific to exports. Tim Haggerty is the export specialist, and before coming to the commission, he worked for Mayor Sealand for 30 years, serving in multiple operational management roles. In the past year, he met with a couple of federal agencies, including the U.S. Commercial Service and USDA's Transportation Services Division, to explore how we can reach more exporters, to make them aware of our services and how we can help them. Tim also attended several industry events. Um, he attended locally uh, uh, annual events for the National Customs Brokers and Forwarders Association of America and CBFAA, the National District Export Council, and the American Association of Port Authorities. Notably, Tim was able to travel to Tacoma, Washington to attend the Agriculture Transportation Coalition AgTC's annual meeting. Additionally, Tim has had direct meetings with several exporters this year, and he hopes to increase those connections in the year ahead. Outreach. We are planning to ramp up our outreach efforts this coming fiscal year. We have worked to correct or delete outdated online material. There is new material that has been drafted, but awaiting release until the updates to the uh, website are completed. Part of the plan includes uh, attending more conferences and scheduling meetings. Um, right now, we have um, we have plans to meet with FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and um, several of the consumer protection offices for New York, Florida, California, New Jersey, and Illinois. Um, if you don't mind giving me a couple more minutes, uh, the last slide was to tell the public while we have their attention on how to contact caters. Uh, you can go to our website, which is fmc.gov, and on the homepage, there is a, a section that says how to file a complaint. You hit that link, and the first item on that next page is a link to caters, but further below are links to how to um, to the forms that we have to complete for a cargo complaint and a cruise complaint. Um, you please, you know, if they can please complete the form and attach any documentation, and they would email that to complaints at fmc.gov. And you can email questions to inquiries at fmc.gov. We look forward to hearing from more people. It has been a pleasure speaking with you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Uh, De La Cruz. Really an impressive uh, array of things that you're working on and um, impressively uh, laid out for us. Um, we'll go to the commissioners uh, for questions. Ho hopefully our questions are just as impressive. Uh, Commissioner Dye. Of course. In 2010, we started this rapid response program and had a voluntary agreement from our major carriers to respond. If the, um, if the head of caters called them, they agreed to pick up the phone. And uh, I know our exporters had several situations in which they believed that a call from the CEO could quickly find a bill of lading. So where do we stand with that program today? Commissioner, thank you for the question. I do believe that with the VOCC audit, they were able to get certain contacts for the vessel operators, and that list has been shared with me. And so I do have that available if needed. Overall, as uh, was mentioned earlier, there the VOCCs have set up let's say um, their own ADR programs or things to assist consumers. And so I do think that reflects a bit in the decrease in numbers for this past year, because I think they are handling matters internally. But um, in addition to that, again, we are always available. They can reach out directly and we will try to make that call um, as quickly as we can to the um, information. And I know that BTA updates those contacts. Um, I think they're privy to updates um, 
when the v the VOCC audit, um, they they were the ones who compiled the contact list. And so if and there have been some changes in the past year, and they update the list. And again, I have access to it. Are these are these new contacts the compliance officers? Um, I believe most of them are Generally. compliance officers, but they are also officers within the company, you know, VPs and and. The like. I'd love to see that list. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and actually, Chairman Privilege, I'm going to just do a quick follow up. Um, Ms. Marvin, can you can you uh, give a little more detail on? It, it sounds to me like the program still exists, but because of the vessel operating common carrier audit program, which we are not, which we have not given an update on in this particular commission meeting, but it's somewhat subsumed in that. Uh, can you explain that to us a little bit more and follow up to um, I Commissioner think that, question? Of, I'm sorry. So sorry. Yeah, yes, of course, um, sir. Uh, um, I think that the probably for ease and the establishing uh, compliance officers, a lot of the compliance officers are also part of the rapid response team. So it's, the, so a lot of our our questions from the VOCC audit program um, and any any commercial issues or disputes that come up, it's usually that same person, the, the, the compliance officer that that a lot of these things are funneled to. And so it ends up being the same person. OK, and I saw you making a gesture towards Commissioner Dye because compliance officers was uh, requiring those was one of her major recommendations, yes. in fact, finding 29. So. And thank yep. you for that. I, and I, I just add that these are people who have direct access to CEOs. Um, so um, it increases their effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Um, Commissioner Benzel. I, I appreciated your uh, presentation. Very well done. So uh, thank you. Thank you all staff for the work they've done. Uh, so uh, you had uh, export uh, statistics in terms of the the volume of, of uh, I'm really interested in, in uh, seeing if you could do the same thing on the import side or if it would be uh, difficult to do that uh, or not. It was a lot more cases to do it. And we are right now working with a manual worksheet that we had established at the beginning of this fiscal year. So we can't really give a comparison to the prior year okay. with the database today. We hope that with some modernization, we will get there, but um, we can also have my staff work on trying to get the import statistics for you. You know, I don't want to make work, but I think this is important to get a sense. Uh, and I'm during the pandemic, I had a lot of people coming in with complaints, and it's it would be interesting to see whether it's tracking. Uh, so, uh, healthcare products uh, being used as respirators and 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 ish, chemicals, uh, imported chemicals. Uh, it, I had fisheries uh, products that were sold in restaurants. So it would be interesting to get, to get a sense of whether or not there's a class or category of, of uh, shipments that are having uh, a greater problems. So I think it's worthwhile at the end of the day to, 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 uh, to keep continuing to track that. And uh, it's important that exports uh, take priority, but, uh, but I, I think it does give us a sense of of where there's problem areas. Um, but that's all. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Benzel. No good deed goes unpunished. You do such a good job of presenting the export uh, uh, details. So now we're going to want it on import. So apologize for that. But I also do echo uh, what Commissioner uh, Benzel is saying. Uh, Commissioner Sola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. De La Cruz. Um, as you know, I've always been a, a, a very strong proponent of caters and I think that when anyone asks me what the FMC does, I usually kind of give a description of what caters does in resolving problems because we, we have a success story almost every day and in, in almost every case that comes before you. And, and the work that you do is absolutely uh, phenomenal uh, upon this. Um, one specific question that I have on, on complaints by locations, are you including both uh, uh, cruise complaints with the cargo complaints? Is that what Florida is number two in the country? I focused this time on commercial cargo. I should have probably specified that on the slide, uh -huh. but we can get information for the PVO side. Although I will say, as I mentioned, the, the, the PVO complaints have decreased substantially. Um, I think people are very happy to cruise again. And um, as before the pandemic, there's always things that happen, but um, you know, 
in the end of the day, we have seen a decrease from last year. I think it was 130 versus 74. But we can get you statistics on that or include, again, I focused on commercial cargo because I know that knew that was going to be of great interest and especially the exports based on the last meeting. But again, we can try to get you. I, I don't need it. I know it's 99% our employer. <laughs> So I don't need that. But I will take advantage of, of having Ms. Marvin uh, sitting next to you and ask you the next question. How is caters working with the charge complaints? Or do you work at all? Or are they a completely different process for those inquiries that come in? They are a completely different process. But we do, I, I will say that we handle everything that comes through the door. And that includes, as I mentioned, that we will direct to other offices if needed. And so we will review material. And if um, it always depends on the complainant, what they're seeking. And we are happy to help on charge complaints from an informal basis. Uh, but oftentimes they have already sought um, some type of um, remedy from the VOCC directly, and therefore they want action. And so they want the charge complaint, and then we will refer them to that process. Um, and then other times they might not meet the threshold for the charge complaint. It was too long ago or other things. And so they those people will be referred to our office as much as they are informed about. We, we will talk them through an informal docket, formal proceeding. You know, we explain all of the processes that are available to them at the commission. And then even, you know, sometimes if it's an unlicensed NVO or things like that, we will tell them you might have a better a result if you went to a small claims court in your local area. So it just depends, but we will always try to help. And, um, but I will say charge complaints is a separate process. I, I think you answered my question, but let me, let me answer it again mm -hmm. um, or ask it again. Uh, are sometimes the charge complaints that come in, I think would be better handled by caters rather than go through that process. So as you just said, do you have a reciprocal with them? If you have certain uh, cases or circumstances that come in, maybe you feel that that should go to another another place, such as charge complaints. Is that reciprocal? I, is there sometimes charge complaints that come in that could be better resolved by caters? And are you getting access to those cases? I cannot speak for the charge complaints process. Like I said, I'm, I I know I have spoken with several investigators. We've always had a good rapport um, with all of them across the country. Um, at the end of the day, again, we will we don't tend to refer things too much. Uh, we really try to assist, and I think the assistance we provide is very quick. And so, if at the end of the day, though, it does not resolve in. Uh, or the complainant just is not happy with the res with the responses we received, they're always, you know, they can pursue other options. And that could be filing a charge complaint. It could be going to the informal docket process or a formal proceeding or going private to, you know, civil litigation or things like that, arbitration. I, I mean, it just depends. But we do have an ongoing dialogue, I guess, uh, with the investigators um, if if there's something that overlaps. You know, we want to know what they've already done at times, and we will let them know um, if they ask us. But I have to be honest, I, I don't think we get too much from them. But let me ask Ms. Marvin a question. Ms. Marvin, if you have a, a charge complaint that comes in that you feel that would be best handled by the great resource that we have in Caters, uh, do we have a protocol in place that we can go ahead and seek fast relief for for that charge for for a charge complaint that could be handled by caters? Yes, absolutely. So if it's if it's determined really that the issue uh, is not particularly suited for charge complaints and really should get sent over to caters, it would get sent over there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. I mentioned fact finding 29, so let me mention fact finding 30, uh, which was uh, led by Commissioner Sola, which um, 
did allow us to both modestly enhance some passenger protections while at the same time, I think, helping to restore confidence in the cruise industry after COVID. So thank you for that. And um, and thank you, my fellow commissioners, for supporting that work. Uh, now we'll go to Commissioner Beckage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. De La Rosa, um, I see 25.9% of the complainants are in California. Is that because of the volume? Is that reflective of the volume? Yes, I think definitely it's the volume. I think that throughout the pandemic, post uh, D and D complaints came in, um, where you know L.A. Long Beach was highly congested. So um, I think that was the early part of the year. We have seen a slight decrease on the commercial cargo in the last few months. So I think that is reflective of. Um, the industry right now, you know, vessel space availability and lower rates, things like that. So it's a good thing, right? Less sure. less problems, less complaints. Uh, you're, you're at the pointy end of the sword there for uh, dealing with this stuff. So, I, yeah, I think that's a, definitely an indicator. Um, if we could uh, also, I'm curious about the export cases by commodity types, and I'm glad you broke those down. And I, too, would echo Commissioner Bensel's desire to see this on imports. And, and frankly, as far as uh, more work, I like to see more more reasons for the FMC to exist. So providing those numbers, I think, would be a valuable tool in us monitoring the situation of cargo. But if I could ask a specific question on export cases by commodity type uh, uh, vehicles, uh, I, I know we do an awful lot of used vehicle exports. Um, maybe, um, I'm curious, I probably, we probably don't break it down by new unused. I believe exports. the majority of those are used. New vehicles are technically not under the commission's jurisdiction as an exempted commodity. So the majority of what we see now within used vehicles, there are, um, what I call, um, you know, somebody reselling uh, SUV versus uh, vehicles that are sold at auction, and they're usually more um, not running, um, and therefore they're going to get shipped overseas to be made into parts more often than not. I've seen it all, so <laughs> I've uh, just uh, was curious, uh, and I've actually uh, have shipped uh, American-made Jeeps to China. Um, in the past, so um, those probably didn't count, so. Well, I can't speak, I mean, um, I, I don't, again, I don't think, but but you will see like machinery is there, and at times that might be a bulldozer, it, you know, it might be, um, and you know, uh, I'm thinking of trucks that are, you know, the big construction. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, but the used, the vehicles is pretty much used vehicles and whether it's your sedan SUV, whatever. Yeah. My, my I wonder now machinery uh, is split out from that. And, uh, but I've seen an awful lot of uh, row row uh, exports of, you know, scook and heavy duty machinery, yes. dump trucks, bulldozers, graders. Yes. And, you know, um, combines, for example. So, uh, and those would be go under, machinery or would they be under vehicles or would they not be counted at all they would be under machinery um and we do hand so this was not broken out by contain like containers versus row row we do this is by our complaint cases and we do handle mm, sure. row row break bulk you know okay someday maybe we'll have a system where we get into the fine fine points of it so uh, uh, Commissioner Sola uh, uh, volunteered that Florida probably is the source of all the passenger complaints and uh, Seattle and Tacoma are not. And so uh, must be. I would say that is not true. Um, there is a new river provider of biking um, in the U.S., but there are certain cruises that go out of Washington um, or, yes, uh, mostly to Alaska, mm -hmm. uh, but they call it British Columbia. So um, there, there is that. Um, it's not, so again, this was for commercial cargo, but we can create a map for PVO. <laughs> if you give us more time, we will do so. 
uh, on the whole, though, I'm, I appreciate Commissioner Sola's work and your work on uh, making passengers happy. And it's an um, important industry for all of us who are blessed with cruise ships that visit their, those ports. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beckich. And uh, uh, I will uh, friendly, uh, in a friendly way, remind the commissioners that we represent the entire country <laughs> and not just uh, not just our regional proclivities, but uh, but having come from uh, the U.S. Congress, I certainly uh, under understand those. Um, I do want to uh, uh, mention, in terms of the um, uh, the 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 well, one one question on the things that that are outside our jurisdiction, right? Somebody calls up and complains about uh, you know rail service or something like that. Are you do, do we uh, are we able to still return those calls and at least tell them that we don't have jurisdiction? We acknowledge 100% of what comes through our door. Um, now, we may not be able to assist, but we are going to call them. We're going to find out. Um, I have had my, uh, um, my staff ask me about rail. And I said, you know, is there still a container? Are we talking about the railhead? And if so, we will reach out. We have done some joint efforts with STB. And we have referred people to STV, and STV has referred items to us. Um, you know all about the different um, jurisdictions, and so STV has some different tools than we do. So um, again, we're here to try to help people get the assistance they need, and that's our major goal. No, that's terrific. And I will uh, note that you mentioned several, many, many, even more than I knew about before, uh, both uh, federal and state level um, consumer agencies that you're in touch with, so that's good. I, I also was very pleased to see that map. I agree with you um, that it is nice to see that we service shippers and uh, uh, individuals, passengers uh, throughout the United States. Um, this is not something that's uh, you know just in, in on the ocean side. Um, so appreciate that. Um, so this this may be a question more for Ms. Marvin. I'm trying to get a sense of, I mean, the activity at the FMC, um, and it's it's been a little bit difficult to figure out because if we just go on cases filed, well, that doesn't include all, all sorts of things that caters handles before they become a case. If we go on uh, private sector cases, uh, you know, well, that doesn't include all the various public sector things, even investigations. Um, Etc. Can you give? Do you have any metrics about just the overall activity or uh, things coming into caters or or uh, something like that? I know. I know. For instance, we used to have one uh, administrative law judge who could handle the whole caseload, and now we've had to go up to three because of that increased caseload. But are there other kinds of things that we can point to as uh, how the uh, the the volume of incoming inquiries and complaints has has been? Thank you for that question, sir. Um, I, I don't have exact numbers at my fingertips at the moment, but of course, happy to follow up. We, um, we have, I think, done a really good job of reporting on, I would say, the um, the exponentially um, increased volumes of work that's come into the to the commission, and I would say that just the last two years, I think. Um, uh, you know, our our secretary's office was reporting a uh, significant increase in just cases filed and things like that. We do keep um, we do keep data on all of this. And again, I just don't have it with me at this commission meeting, but I can certainly uh, report back to you on that. Yes, if appropriate. I mean, I'm not interested in getting metrics to the detriment of actually doing the work, right? So we yes. have the metrics, though, yeah. sir. Okay. I just apologize. I just don't have them with me. Yes, right it's now. just De La Cruz. I was just, uh, can I add one thing? I mean, we have been reporting inquiries and acknowledged. So it's acknowledged, Good. but might not become a case. And that has, um, it's, yeah. it's in our reports. I did mean to come with those totals, and I apologize. It, 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 it's tricky. We but can provide those easily. I think you're being too hard on yourself. What's tricky here? here is 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 what you know what kind of case goes where and are we double counting something that goes both to caters and to enforcement and that sort of thing um i want to get back to uh the, the point commissioner die made about a phone call from the fmc um do you feel miss dilla cruz that if you pick up the phone and call 
a, 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 a line, either a cruise line or a, a container line. Um, will you get your call answered on behalf of, a, of somebody calling in? Majority of the time I will. Um, some are faster than others. Um, and so we have reached out sometimes to your offices, commissioners, or um, specifically when we had an issue with a cruise line to the council and be like, with fact finding 30, can you get us a new contact? So we do reach out um, if I'm not getting a response, but more often than not, they, I mean, I mean these are very high level people within an organization. So understandably, they may not. <laughs> no, but that's what, that's what, that's what you are as well. But I, I think that's the, exactly the right thing. I encourage you to contact um, any and all of the five of us, depending on the, the uh, uh, kinds of complaint and stuff, it may be more appropriate for one or the, and the other. I think on this stuff, I can say we're all a team um, and, and we want to be able to help. And I think, I think in many cases we can certainly prefer that than not being able to help somebody, right? You know, come come to us. When I was a, a congressman, I used to tell the caseworkers, look, sometimes we won't be able to help people, but all I need to know is we've done absolutely everything we can uh, to help them, uh, referring them to somebody else, that's fine. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Ms. Marvin, on, on the charge complaints, I know we got past that, but I, uh, I this has reminded me of a, a line of questioning on this. Um, Often um, when a charge complaint just starts to get investigated and you'll call the carrier, my understanding is a lot of the carriers do just refund the money on that charge often. Is, is, that, is that true? Um, I think a lot of times the, the carriers do want to, to um, just make the dispute go away. And they have often just- But they don't even settle. They a just, refund they just or a waiver. Uh, that has happened, yes. Does that is that a little dis, dis, discouraging? You get this great case, and then you call them up, and they immediately give in. I hear you. <laughs> um, I, I I understand what you're saying. Um, I I do think at the end of the day, the uh, at, at that point, the process has worked. We're trying to get uh, people where they should get their waivers, get their refunds, whatever it is that that needs to happen, and. Um, stuff keeps moving. Good. I'm going to just quickly check with my colleagues to see if there are any additional questions. Commissioner Dye? No, thank you for the briefing. It was excellent. No more questions. Thank you. Commissioner Benzel? Uh, no questions. Thank uh, the staff for all the work. Commissioner Sola? No question. Thank you. Commissioner Beckage. No questions. Thank you. That just leaves it to me, I think, to, th to thank you again. And, and Ms. De La Cruz, since you're up here today presenting, I want to thank particularly your staff, um, who I happen to know are overworked. But we are, as you mentioned, uh, continuing to hire. Uh, this was one of the mandates of OZRA, and they gave us the resources to do it. Obviously, it is always it's a challenge to hire in this environment and that sort of thing. So I'm not saying anything's going too slow. I think it's amazing how much volume we do handle. Um, but we'll continue to to try to do that. I think again, the presentation was good, and I want to thank Ms. Marvin and Ms. Huey, Mr. Huey, for uh, uh, for for all of your work again in in other implementation. Um, one quick uh, one quick thank you is just a, a, a we did not get a new commission room. Uh, this is in fact the Surface Transportation Board's commission room. We are though getting uh, after. I don't know how long, nobody remembers, 25 years or something since the last commission room overhaul at the F F FMC. We are going to overhaul it and finally get it uh, into the 21st century. It's only taken 23 years to do that. Um, and uh, so that's why we are meeting here. But I want to thank uh, Chairman Marty Olbermann and uh, all the, the other four members of the Service Transportation Board and indeed their staffs who, who've helped us put this together today. Um, and uh, with that, Madam Secretary, I think we're ready to conclude. Are there... Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes all matters on the commission's agenda today. Okay, without objection, this concludes the meeting. Thank you very much.